Receive your Bibles right now as we are in the book of Matthew, chapter 27 of the book of Matthew. I marvel at God at the way that he does things. He's amazing. Um, I fly on Delta quite a bit until I'm actually a diamond flyer, which means you've had to fly 125,000 miles within a year. And uh, so I, I know Delta fairly well. And when they all of a sudden, the day before the flight canceled it, um, and there wasn't even any, never was any snow. <laughs> and this is what you call a divine setup. <laughs> uh, uh, Pastor Josh and I, we would laugh, all of us would laugh, we'd get in the, uh, his truck and we'd drive and go, he'd say, I'm having such a hard time driving through this blizzard. I said, so I know you better put on your four wheel drive. <laughs> but we, we give honor to the men of God that are here tonight, we appreciate them. Matthew chapter 27, and we want to look at verse 26. Verse 26. Then released to you Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. I'll read that one more time. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The Lord bless you. Thank you as you're seated in his wonderful presence. We do want to honor Bishop and Sister Malanson. We love them both so much and highly respect them. We appreciate you. Amen. Uh, how can you not love Sister Malanson? She just has such a beautiful spirit. <laughs> appreciate her very much. And pastor, amen, and his, his wife, we love them both and appreciate them. So grateful. We've just had such wonderful and sweet fellowship. And, of course, I'm grateful to the Lord for the gift which he's given me in the presence of my wife. We thank God for you and your ability to usher in the presence of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 27, where we just read, I wanted to speak to you on this subject. One of the greatest lessons from the cross one of the greatest lessons from the cross. As you know, we've been speaking to you about the cross, and I pray you're, pray you're encouraged to study about the cross and not just assume that you understand the cross. The cross is something you must spend some time on. You must pray. You must ask God to show you. To be quite honest, there's so many scriptures about it, as we've shown some of them. And there's so many things that Jesus did for us. But unfortunately, in the midst of this, there are some lessons that the cross teaches us that we virtually don't even ever hear coming forth, no matter how long we've been within the church. There are some lessons that God has given from this cross that it is imperative that we learn. The cross is the hallmark of Christianity. Everything looked towards that cross and everything looks back at the cross. The cross is the central figure of Christianity. It is not about trying to wear some chain around your neck with a cross. The cross was not beautiful. The cross was not decorative. The cross was bloody and nasty. The cross was rugged. The cross was a place of death and torture. You have to understand that the cross was developed by the Syrians. Crucifixions was developed by the Syrians. The reason why they developed it was they felt people died too quickly. And also it took too much manpower to torture someone. So they developed something where once they nailed you to this, they could leave you. And they knew you would experience the most excruciating death. The word crucifixion comes from the word excruciating. They knew you would experience one of the most excruciating deaths that would be known to mankind. And nobody had to stay there and inflict any pain upon you. It was automatic afflicted by the cross. Cursed is every man that dies upon the tree. But there is a lesson of understanding that's coming from this cross that God must give to us. You see, the cross 
a place of extreme torture. Sometimes we do not, really do not know what kind of physical torture Jesus underwent. You must understand that he was not nailed through the palms. To the Romans, the hand was also included at the base of the hand. If you feel your hand, you will notice that there were two bones that are right there towards the base of the hand. He was nailed there because there's no way the weight of his body, it would rip right through his skin. And he was nailed at this point, and what that did is sever the nerves. So it caused fire to literally run through his arms. When they nailed him through his feet, you must understand the torturous aspect of the cross. It was also cutting of nerves, which caused fire to run up his legs. This means that when he was bent down, because he would get tired from trying to hold himself up, there was a little foot stand where he could push up on that was being nailed to, both feet, one spike. And what would transpire is when he would slouch down, the chest cavity would cave in from the pressure of the body weight, and then he would not be able to breathe. They would come gasping for air, and so he would push up again on that nail and on that little stand, and now his chest cavity would begin to expand, and now he would be able to breathe again. But in that process, now his legs would start to burn from bearing the weight, and so it was this up and down motion you must understand that because when he's carrying on conversation, you must realize that many times he is actually gasping through the conversation. When the thief says to him, I want you to remember me. Now the thief was having some of the same problems he was having because they both were being crucified. They were gasping. This was not your normal common conversation. This was... <gasps> You could hear the gasping and the rattling and the struggle to live and to breathe. There's something about this regarding the cross. Can I tell you in simplicity one of the greatest lessons of the cross that we have missed? It is the ability to die to self. We are so self-driven. It is an I world, iPad, an iPhone. It is an I world. And that's why sometimes we look and just give simple illustrations, such as what is the middle letter of the word sin? And what is the middle letter of the word pride? When it's all about I, that is sin, that is pride. Because the cross is anti-I. The cross is about being selfless. The cross is about the crucifixion of one's own desires. If you look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. There is a lesson that we must further get down to when we get to this cross, but let's introduce it. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The apostle Paul begins to preach. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the Christ that liveth within me. Do you understand what he's telling you? I have died to myself. I have died to what I want. I have died to my desires. And I have died to my purpose. The reason why some of us are so disappointed, you have never died to your purpose. Can I tell you, when we do things that symbolize the cross, we deal with baptism, the Greek word baptizo. Well, when we deal with baptism in Jesus' name, understand what the apostle told us about baptism. He told us that we are buried with him in baptism. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. He said, I want you to understand the purpose for which you are baptized. Because what happens to many, you go down a dry devil, you come up a wet one. But you have to understand, buried with him. Everyone shout him. It didn't say buried with them. It said buried with him. 
buried with him in baptism. Now you start to rise. You get up and you walk. It's an operation that's happening on you. Watch how this works. Baptism, baptism in Jesus' name. The word baptizo, the word name, character, identity, purpose, majesty. So to be baptized into Jesus' name is to be buried, planted, submerged into Jesus' identity, into Jesus' character, into Jesus' purpose, into Jesus' majesty. Therefore, how can you be so disappointed that you're not getting your purpose when you were buried into his purpose? Planted, buried, and submerged into his purpose. If it is his purpose for you to never marry. If it is his purpose for you never to have children. If it is his purpose, amen, for you to know certain struggles in order to develop you to become like him. You must understand how this works. Jesus could take the cross in one massive blow. We cannot do that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. So what God does for us is give us little mini crosses every day that over the span of our life, it can add up to the cross. Hallelujah. So listen to Paul, but that I might know him. He said, in the power of of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death if by any means I may obtain unto the resurrection of the dead. But back up to what he's saying in verse 10. Get what he's saying. Paul, you made a mistake here it looks like because he says power of a resurrection, fellowship of suffering. Hold on, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus suffered first, Paul, then he died. Paul reverses the order and puts the power of the resurrection first, then the fellowship of the suffering next. Paul, what are you doing? Simple. He's telling us, you can't do it like Jesus. You've got to have the power of the resurrection to go through the fellowship of the suffering. So that when you're buried with him in baptism, you rise to walk in the newness of life. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. And hear what the apostle again tells us because he is instructing us and giving us understanding. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, give me some understanding. He said, now you've got to know this, that your old man is being destroyed. You've got to understand this, that this old man is supposed to go down in the waters of baptism and get destroyed. Now here is the problem. The problem is some of us have got our old man so dizzy. He doesn't know whether he's up or down. Because as soon as something happens, as soon as we get hurt, we tell our old man, which means our nature that's not like God, oh, you got to get up. So, no, sorry, you got to get up because we got to handle this over here. We got to tell this person off, so you, you need to get up. And so we've got this old man like a yo-yo going up and down and up and down. And, and God said, do you understand the purpose of the cross? Baptism was likened unto the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the cross because it was meant that you were going to kill yourself. No, we're not talking physical. No, we're not talking suicide. We're talking character. We're talking things that are not like God, that you are willing to lay it down and now become like him. I will lay everything at your feet. I will lay every dream, every aspiration, every desire, I lay it down. I lay every character flaw, anything that's not like you, I lay it down. And I say to you that it is my joy to do your will. Can anybody shout, it's my joy to do God's will. Look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. Hear the apostle John now speak to us. He said, the four and twenty elders bow down before him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns down before him. Do you understand? People talk about, when I get to heaven, I can't wait to get a crown. That's wonderful. But do you understand the purpose of the crown? The purpose of the crown is not to decorate you. The purpose of the crown is to decorate him. It's for you to throw it at his feet. 
that liveth forever and ever. And did you hear what they're saying? For thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Listen to this. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are. That word pleasure also will. Pleasure. They are and were created. You were created for God. I went to verse 11. You are created for God. You were not created for your purpose. You were always created for the purpose of God. And why you must have a cross is because you must learn the ultimate lesson of the cross. It's how to lay down self and die. I don't know about you, but I always marvel at the cross. This is not some puny little human that simply has no power being taken. This is God in flesh. This is not somebody that does not have authority and power. This is someone that has enough authority and power to call down 12 legions of angels and never get in the fight himself. A legion was a Roman legion from anywhere from three to 6,000. That means anywhere from 36,000 to 72,000 angels he could have called down and never entered into the fight. If you want to understand the power of that, one angel in the Old Testament killed 185,000 men. You start doing the math. This means that these angels have the capacity to wipe out 13.2 billion people. And the present population had not even reached a billion. He said, that I've got enough to wipe this population 12 times over and never enter into a fight. May I tell you the real power of crucifixion. That's why Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. The real power of crucifixion is when you know you can escape, but you willingly lay down. No, friend, you're not just being a martyr. Some of you, you have a martyr complex. You want to be everyone's savior. So God has to say to you, get off the cross. We need the wood. We can make a table, a chair out of it, because your cross doesn't save. It's not a martyr complex. It's when God tells you to lay down. It's when God instructs you to lay down. It's when you don't want to do it. Submission begins when you don't want to do it. I don't want to do this. I don't feel like lifting my hands. I don't feel like opening up my mouth. I wonder, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever just come to church and just want to sit there? You don't feel like lifting your hands. You don't feel like opening up your mouth. It's not your character. It's not your personality. You're just not in the mood tonight. But no wonder Psalm 34 verse 1. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continue be in my mouth somebody shout I will Look at Psalm 33, also verse 1. Psalm 33, verse 1. Listen to what the psalmist said. He said, praise is calmly to the upright. Calmly means beautiful. You look beautiful when you praise. Yeah, you look beautiful to God and you look ugly when you don't. <sighs> mm -hmm. Yeah, tore up from the flow up. You look ugly when you don't because praise brings a beauty to it. Praise means I don't care how I feel, you're worthy to be praised. May I tell you why some of you struggle with crucifixion? Because you won't even do just the small thing to lift your hands to him who gives you power. Oh, you'll lift your hands and shout for a team. Oh, you'll lift your hands and shout for a movie star or a singer. But he that slam dunk the sun right in the middle of heaven and upholds it by the words of his own power. For him, you won't even lift your hands and you want to know why you're struggling with your own desires. 
The power of the cross is crucifixion of self. Can I come down deeper? The most, according to science, the two most powerful things within us is self-preservation and species preservation. Self-preservation means I fight to live. Even a roach has self-preservation. You flip on the lights, they run. Until they get bold enough and just look at you and go, what up? Everything fights for its life. That's self-preservation. Species preservation means it fights for its own kind. You fight for your children, fight for husbands, fight for people you love. Love fights. For God so loved the world that he gave. Don't you understand why he's hanging on that cross? He's fighting for us. Love fights. Don't tell me you love God and then won't fight to get next to God. The devil is a liar. If you love me, you will fight to get next to me. Love will make you get over your character. Love will step you over your fears. Love will make you go beyond your doubts. Love made me do it. Give somebody a high five and tell them, love made me do it. Love makes me lift my hands. Love made me come here tonight. Love makes me open up my mouth. Love makes me shout and dance. Love makes me do it. Not commandment. Love. Not fear of punishment. Love. So that he could call down 12 legions of angels and never enter into the fight himself. This means he had to overcome self-preservation. This means his desire to live had to be crucified. I want to tell you why we're struggling. It is because our desire to live our way is most of the time greater than our love for God. What he did was show that the truth of the cross is when you will die to yourself and your will, when you will overcome self-preservation to do his will. You say, what do you mean? Well, Matthew chapter 11, verse 6. Matthew chapter 11, verse 6. You remember what's happening on that cross? He's getting pierced. It means pain. You remember what was happening before he got to that cross? I'm in Matthew chapter 11, verse 6. You remember what happened before he got to that cross? He's being scourged. He's being whipped. Pain is being inflicted upon him by people. No, no, no. Not just any people. His kids. His kids who he's giving breath to. His kids who he's giving life to. Experience should have told him, don't go out like this, Jesus. Don't let them hurt you like this. Self-preservation should have told him, open up your mouth and annihilate them. You have to understand, his mouth created the universe. And with the power of his words, he could have annihilated. So that's why he said, blessed is the man who's not offended in me. Offended means, when he says, blessed is the man who's not offended in or because of me, it means you don't seek for reasons to become offended with me for what I allow. It means I'm going to allow things to happen to you. You say, why? Because you need to die. <laughs> because your will's too strong. Because you want what you want and you brag about it. 
because you, you live Frank Sinatra's song of, I did it my way. And that to you is an emblem on your chest. Because you've got it confused with Burger King of, have it your way. You got the wrong king, baby. So I have to allow you to undergo things, to die to self where that was not you before, now it is you to lift your hands. Where that was not you before to lift your voice, now it is you to lift your voice. Because you understand where he brought me from. You understand that he allowed me to go through some things for me to learn how to die to myself and for me to learn how to deal with offense, offenses. Offenses mean things that would cause me to stumble. He allowed me to deal with molestation. He allowed me to deal with rape. He allowed me to deal with harsh words and people that would cut me. Why? So that I would learn to come to him and say, heal me and now let me die to self. Self-preservation tells me that I need to get revenge against them. Self-preservation tells me I need to hurt those that hurt me. But you tell me to love my enemies. You tell me to forgive. This requires death to self. Because our motto is, I don't get mad, I get even. And so what I have to do then is lay down self-preservation. It means that God's going to let you get offended. He's going to let you get offended. He's going to let you get offended. He's going to let people say some harsh words to you. And he's going to let them say it to you right in the church. He's going to let you get offended sometimes with the pastor or with the bishop or with others. Even though they're loving and kind. But he will allow it just to try. Try your spirit. Sometimes God allows you to experience offense just to show you how alive your will really is and how strong your flesh really is. Somebody lift your hands right now and open up your mouth and worship your God. While we're still lifting our hands and worshiping sound people, get up for me. Luke chapter 18, verse 7, please. Luke chapter 18, verse 7. But come on, lift your hands a little while. You're going to have to digest this. You're going to have to pray a moment. Luke chapter 18, verse 7. You're going to have to pray a moment. Won't God deliver those who cry out to him day and night? Won't he avenge them? Yeah, event, revenge belongs to God, not to you. Because your revenge doesn't even hold a candle to the sunlight, S-O-N, of his revenge. But watch this. He will allow people to offend you. He will allow hurts and trials to come to show you how strong your self-preservation is. You say, well, shouldn't I fight to live? Shouldn't I fight for a better life? But it's fight God's way. It's not fighting through your flesh. It's fighting through your spirit. It's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to how the apostle Peter puts it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. He said, the first thing I want you to understand is, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try you. 
Beloved. Did you hear what he called you? Beloved. Beloved means you're the object of God's love. It means God seeks you out to love you. Well, if God loves me, why am I having such a problem? Think it not strange. Quit acting like it's odd, peculiar, unusual that you're experiencing such fiery trials of life as though some strange thing happened unto you. He said, don't you understand the purpose of the trial is to try and test the quality of your character. Every manufacturer tries their product. They test their product. They must do it before they put it on the shelf and sell it to us. So God must test you before he can put you out and use you. And the test that most of us are failing is self-preservation. They hurt my feelings. And when they hurt me, I now move to blame them. And when I blame them, I'm now angry at them. And when I'm angry at them, I'm now going to fight them. And I don't always fight by coming straight out against them. Sometimes I fight by shutting down to them. And God said, some of you, he's whispering in your ear. I let them hurt you just to show you how strong your flesh is. See how fast you get angry? See how quick unforgiveness gets into your heart whenever you're offended? You see how you move quickly into self-pity? You see how fast you move into depression? Do you see how strong your flesh is? Do you see how you don't quickly move towards me and quickly move towards thinking like me? Do you see how you quickly don't move towards forgiveness? Do you see how you quickly don't move towards joy? Because look at verse 13. What am I supposed to do when they're hurting me but rejoice? For in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, you say you want to be like me, but then when you're pierced like me, when you're lied on like me, when family turns on you like they turned on me, then you tell me how unfair it is. You tell me that it's not right. You tell me that I failed you. You tell me that this is not the way it should be. But I want you to understand that I'm causing you to bring your self-preservation and nail it to a cross. And some of you are so protective over your children that you say they are mine, but you won't let me do what I want to do with them. There's certain things I've got to let them go through. There's certain things I've got to allow them to experience. And you won't let them experience it. You tell me they belong to me. But then when they go through it, you cry about it. And you say it's a mother's heart. And it's a father's heart. He said your self-preservation and your species preservation is greater than your love for me. He said, I'm going to raise up a people that are going to enter into Psalms 119. Psalm 119. I'm closing. Psalm 119, verse 164 and 165. Psalm 119, verse 164, 165. Seven times a day do I praise thee for thy righteous judgments. 165. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. How do you get to this point where nothing offends you? Where you stop shutting down your emotions and you go cold and indifferent or you explode with anger and just come out swinging? Death to self. He said you spent time in his presence crying, praying, reading his word, and understanding the purpose for which he's allowing you to go through things. It's that you start pranking the prayer of God, don't let self-preservation and species preservation be greater than my love for you. Help me to love you more than I love me, more than I love my desires, and help me to love you more than I love others. Because for some of you, the opinions of your family, your mother or your father or your friends is more important than God. And your first reaction to something is, what are they going to think? Not, what is God going to think? You're more into species preservation than you are loving God. 
May I tell you the depth and the maturity of Christianity. It is when you love him more than you love you that you can make the prayer that he made. Not my will. But thy will be done. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 1. I just heard the Holy Ghost say this. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 1. God spoke to Samuel and he said these words. How long shall you mourn concerning Saul, seeing I've rejected him? You say, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Very simple. How long are you going to cry over what I've allowed and over what I've done? Yeah, everything didn't go in your life the way I went. In. But what if I said to you, this is what you had to go through to find me. What if I said to you that you had to be allowed to go through that molestation or allowed to go through that lying or allowed to go through a dysfunctional family so that one day you would have the family of God? What if I said to you that I allowed you to have such a horrible father because I was creating a hunger in you for me the ultimate father and it worked because you're here would you say to me that I am not worth it would you say to me it still was unfair or would you die to self and say thank you thank you because when I compare whatever it was I've gone through to the cross I wonder if somebody can lift your hands with me and say, I got the better end of the deal. <sighs> I mean, I got the better end of the deal. <sighs> oh God, bring me out of selfishness. Wounds can make us selfish and self-centered and they make me feel justified. They make me feel right for feeling the way I feel. Because you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said to me. And you don't know how that cut me. <sighs> you don't know what it's doing to me. What my children are doing. You don't know what my husband or my wife is doing. It's ripping my heart out. You don't understand. God said, I understand. And I understand that I'm allowing this so that you'll release self-preservation to me and you'll release species preservation and you'll cry out to me and say help me to love you more than I love myself and more than I love anybody else you give life you are love you bring light to the dark
honest and transparent with you tonight. I've been walking with God for a little while now. And I have personally discovered greatest fight was with self-preservation and species preservation. That when God would sometimes, many things God would tell me to do, I had learned, I would go and do, and I would do it with joy. God even a few years ago told me to lay down and be crucified. And I did. By his help. But what I discovered was after these wounds were afflicted, it activated a self-preservation in me that activated my flesh. And then the Lord began to talk. He said, I allowed them to crucify you and I told you to lay down to receive it, to uncover the strength of your self-preservation that had been there all along. He said, tell my people if they want revival and they want my move, self must die. You cannot love you more than you love me. And you cannot love your children and your family and friends and husband and wives more than you love me. In St. John 21 and 15, St. John 21 and 15, just in the midst of the verse, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? What do you mean? More than everything else. Not am I your only love. No, no, no. Because you're designed to love. Am I your greatest love? Because whatever your greatest love is, it will control every other love below it, including your love for me. So if you love yourself more than you love me, that love will control your love for me. And that's why you have such a hard time lifting your hands. Because you're more concerned about being embarrassed about you. You're more concerned about how you're getting viewed. And you're more concerned about people thinking about you. And so because you love you more than you love me, you have a hard time lifting your hands and raising your voice to me. I want to challenge you tonight. You want a move of God? That's awesome. He wants to give you a move. But you cannot love your past and your wounds. Some of you don't want to get healed because you love the attention, the affection, the hurts give you. Because it's about me. And it gives me a legitimate reason to continue the way I am. Oh, God's not minimizing your hurt. And yes, God wants to heal you. And yes, God wants to help you. But he doesn't want you stuck. He doesn't want you going around circles around it. And not being able to go beyond it. So God's challenging somebody. Will you ask me to help you? To love me more? than everything else. Love me more than everything else. Come on, lift your hands and lift your voice. <sighs> Come on, what is it that you love more than God? Who is it that you love more than God? you want a spouse more than you want God. You want a wife or a husband more than you want God. Some of you miss someone who's died, a, a mother, a sister, a brother, a father, more than you miss God. And it's not that it doesn't hurt to, to have them gone, but do you love me more? That species preservation. Do you love me more? I'm giving you the keys. I'm giving this church by the Spirit of the Lord the keys 
into a true move of God that is lasting. For it's when flesh gets in the way that the move of God dies. understand what we read as our opening scripture that they released Barabbas and they scourged and sent Jesus to be crucified death to self releases others you want people to be released from their bondage you want people to get released from their guilt and their shame you want people to get released from the hold of their past? It happens when you die to self. And you die to self-preservation and species. But our problem is we want this great move. We want souls to be saved. We want people to get released. But we don't want to be sent to be crucified to do it. Barabbas got released because Jesus was being sent to be crucified. People have asked my wife and I, how are you so able to help us? How are you able to so minister? I'll tell you how. We both have our individual stories of death to self, of having to learn to be crucified and lay down and give up self-preservation and species preservation in order for you all to be released. And God's contention is this, that people are so grateful that you're willing to pay the price to do it, but they're not willing to pay the price themselves to do it for somebody else. Somebody lift your hands right now. Somebody begin to ask God, I, wanna, I want you to be my greatest love. I want to love you more than I love me. I want to love you more than I love children, husband, wife, mother, father. I want to love you more. Help me to die to self-preservation and species preservation. I need you to control it. I need you to control my self-preservation and species preservation. I need you to help me to stop being ruled by hurts and by the fear of being hurt. 
and by the fear of failure and by the fear of people and by the fear of the future and of the unknown because perfect love casts out fear. Come on, that's right. So I need uh, Brother Mac and his wife, if he's here, if she is here. Pastor, if you get Brother Mac for me, please. I need him too. Just stand right, right here. Brother David, right where you there, would you bring me the oil, the bottle of oil? told me that before I left here that there was an anointing which he was dispensing upon these that are here right now. The Lord told me to begin with Bishop that God said he's anointing you to be a seer. As you know there's prophets and you've been feeling the prophetic for some time but it's not just a prophet it's a particular type of prophet it's a seer it's one who God causes your eyes to be open and you see supernatural world you see God will sometimes give you visions sometimes give you dreams or sometimes you're just sitting there and all of a sudden it's like you're watching a movie and you just see that's a seer and God said that you're to be anointed for that for the Lord said in this year he is stepping you up into the office of a seer thank you for that anointing thank you for that fresh anointing Thank you for that fresh anointing. 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 In like manner, man of God, you and I have already talked and discussed, but I had, when the Lord had let me minister to you, I had not heard this. But he said, although I have called this man a seer, he must be anointed as a seer. For as David was called to be king, but then there came the day he was anointed as king. And so the Lord said, I am anointing you this day. And it is the Lord who declares unto you that I have given you reckless faith. I've given you radical faith. And I've called you to believe me for the impossible. 
but son truly recognize what I've given you I've given you the gift of faith for I will combine the seer with the gift of faith. The gift of faith is above and beyond the measure that is given unto every man. A measure of faith. So God anoints you also as a seer. One who sees from the hand of God. You will see. Be not afraid. For God speaks to both of you, Bishop. He speaks to you, Brother Mac, he speaks to you. Everything I show you, you will not always want to see. And sometimes you will say to me, God, please, I, I wish I didn't even know this. I don't want to know this. But I say unto you, my children, recognize the privilege that I give you. For I will not only show you the ugly and the bad, but I will also show you the good and the pleasant. But whatever I show you, Rejoice. Never tell me that you don't want to see. But always rejoice. Rejoice. Pastor, we've been talking, you know, my wife and I, we've been talking. The Lord has spoken about you coming into the prophetic. But again, the Lord spoke to me that even though he has activated this gift into you, you must now be anointed to be a prophet. What God is doing in anointing you of being a prophet, he's opening your ears to hear. You shall hear the voice of God with clarity, and you shall have the confidence of knowing that it is God. I anoint you as a prophet. You must hear. You must hear. You must hear. You must hear. Shakamama. You must hear. Shakamama Rashake. Shakimama Rabamata. You must hear. Shakama Rababa Babo Shakala Baba Shaka. Shakita Rabo Rababa Mandria Sata Rababa. Sakanda Rebedria Shakata Rababa Babo Shaka. You must hear. Sister Malonson, God spoke to me and said, She sometimes asked me, even though she's come to a place of being comfortable as far as. It's fine where I am. But sometimes she still asks, what exactly is my place? What is it, God? Where are you calling me now? What do you want me to do? The Lord said, I've placed upon you a heart of compassion that lends you towards hospitality and lends you towards intercession. That I will actually bring people to you. And he said, the intercession and the hospitality and the compassion will many, many times mingle together. I will cause you to pray for someone sometimes and then tell you to get them a gift. Tell you to bring it to them. Hug them. Show them love. And what you do will help heal them and deliver them. So the Lord says, I have great need of you. And I need you to be as if it were a spiritual nurse that assists in operation I need you to help me to heal my people help me to help them to get up and let them know they can make it and sometimes it is simple as your smile for I have gifted you that even in your smile it causes joy in others and sometimes that's all it has to be is just turn and smile at someone and this the, sometimes it's the first time they actually smiled that day but it releases a smile within them that releases some joy. And a merry heart doth good like a medicine. Receive this anointing. That God would minister to that heart of compassion, grant you boundaries, show you, grant you wisdom, and teach you. Rabaku shakama rabaha shekita rabaha shakanda rebebebe boho shekete. Come on, somebody, just lift your hands a moment and let some worship.
The Lord's heard you, woman of God. Who am I? Where am I? Sometimes the devil just tries to make us feel so confused. Where am I going? What's happening? Everything's turned upside down. But the Lord said, I'm going to do something in the midst of your stretching. You have seen your husband's faith over the years. And you have actually at times been jealous of it. Not in a negative way, but a spiritual jealousy. Of God, I, I'd like to have some of that. I, I, I'd like for that kind of faith to start working in me where I'm not worried or anxious or nervous. Or... And the Lord said, I've heard you. And I am releasing a faith in you that's going to bring peace to you. And of her feet. For the Lord said, I anoint your hands and I refresh you. For your hands symbolize your strength and your works. And I am refreshing your strength. And I'm strengthening you to work. And God said, I'm anointing your feet so that you might be able to stand. Do you all have the Amplified Bible back there at all that you can put on the screen? The Amplified Bible. I need Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10 for this woman of God, if you have it in the Amplified. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Woman of God, the Lord said, this is what he's doing with you. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 in the Amplified Bible. Breaks down beautifully the process and what's going on right now. Because God said, I'm going to cause you to stand. He said, if I can cause you to stand, which I will, then you will know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. Isaiah 41 and 10, as you look at this, fear not. There is nothing to fear, for I am with you. Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed, for I am your God. And here is the main part that God's saying to you. I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. I know you want me to move the difficulties. God said, I'm going to strengthen and harden you to deal with them. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my victorious right hand of righteousness and justice. So as faith without works is dead, this is why God anoints your hands and your feet. For he's going to give you the strength to work the work of righteousness. To work the work of righteousness. But the Lord is going to cause you to do divine assignments. And not just assignments. For the Lord is going to cause you to do God ideas, not just good ideas. Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands again right now and worship such a beautiful presence of the Lord in this house. and go to Genesis chapter 49 verse 9 Genesis chapter 49 verse 9 this is for you sister Keisha <clears throat> Judah's a lion's cub with the prey my son you've gone high up the mountain you've stooped down you've couched like a lion and like a lioness who dares provoke and rouse him. It actually goes to lioness because the translation of there actually is lioness because it's the lioness that does the hunting. And the Lord said that when he looks at you, you are a young cub, a lion's cub, his cub, a lioness. 
you've not yet fully developed into who he's going to make you. But he said he's going to teach you how to stoop down, how to couch, which means stalk in prey, so that you are not the prey of depression or worry or misunderstanding or confusion, but you're going to stalk. And the Lord said further that he's going to teach you not just to do that for you and for your family, but to do it for others outside of your family. For the Lord said, you have a strong love for your children, which is beautiful, but I'm going to cause that love to go out to the children of God. And love fights, love fights, love fights. You're going to learn to fight for the children of God. Pastor, I need you to take some oil in your hands and I need you to place it right on her chest. I don't mean to mess up your nice kid's wardrobe, but God said he's just going to have to anoint you there. And the Lord said he's anointing your heart because he's releasing that lioness and he's growing you up from the cub to the young lion. Release this with her. some people in here tonight that will say to the Lord that message was for me and I realize God that I've been allowing wounds and hurts and things to control me and I realize God that I've allowed my past to control me till it's all about me worship means it's all about God but I've made it all about me my hurts my fears my wounds my thoughts and now I'm going back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. Before we leave here, you just got to find a place of prayer. Whether you want to come to the altar, whether you want to kneel, whether you want to stand, whether you want to go to the back, hey friend, that's all up to you. But you just need to find a place of prayer right now and just begin to tell God. If you want to come up here and kneel, 